I usually like to start my videos off with some jokes that rank at about a 3 or 4 out of 10 on the funny scale. I do create board game media with a lighter touch, after all. For this review, you'd probably expect me to make some sort of aftermath pun, like, I played this game with my daughter after math homework. Or make some reference to the movie from 2017 called Aftermath, starring Arnold Schwarzenegger. Not to be confused with 2019's The Aftermath, starring Kiara Knightley and Alexander Skarsgård, the slightly less creepy brother of Pennywise the Clown. Alas, this introduction will be humor-free, just like every episode of The Big Bang Theory. Bazinga! Take one part adventure, one part book, and one part game, and you get Aftermath, an adventure book game. In the game, one to four players take on the role of small misfit critters struggling to survive and thrive in a big, post-apocalyptic, dangerous world. The humans, who previously terrorized these tiny creatures, whether intentionally or not, have disappeared, only to be replaced by other dangerous threats. The game is made up of missions that take players through the story of this abandoned world. They'll venture out of their colony to forage for food, rescue helpless critters, search for useful tools, and other objectives to be revealed as the game is played. Here is the aforementioned adventure book. As you can see, it is a pretty thick book. Several pages, what is there? 105, is that a five? 105 pages if you count the back cover. So there's a lot of pages in there, and the pages include maps and story text. But when you begin, you've got this big old preface, this uh, explanation of what's going on when the story opens, the day of the great calamity. There's this great calamity that happens, and the humans disappear from the world, and none of the animals know what's going on. You'll begin the campaign with this home sweet home that will tell you what it's like there at your colony and what you need to do to get started on the game. And then you will immediately flip over to the next page for your starting mission. I want to stop here and not go any further in the book because I don't want to spoil anything for you. Uh, but you can see what a map looks like. Now this is, doesn't have your standard uh, grid of movement spaces. These are all various shapes and sizes. And there are different terrains, different uh, barriers that you have to deal with, like grass, and as de designated by the green line. Um, a double white line means you can't go through there. So lots of different uh, things to deal with as you're moving around these maps. There are various icons on the maps. There are search icons, um, observation where you go there and there's something to look at. Um, there are places for you to hide so that nobody, will, none of the enemies will see you. Um, places to enter, to exit. Um, all different things on the maps that help you uh, navigate the story. For each mission, you have a mission card that introduces the mission with some nice written flavor text. And on the back, it will tell you your objectives, um, what happens the, or the objective to succeed, or what happens if you fail, the conditions for those, and then um, the method of travel needed. Now, there are different methods of travel across the map. Now, down here we have this map, and this indicates where your team is in this wasteland. Um, there's a grid, and this represents your team, and anywhere you want to move, uh, and most times if you're on foot, you're just going to go uh, to adjacent squares, but sometimes you will um, go to specific places by riding a car or in a rollerblade, things like that, that are really cool. Um, and so what will happen is as you move, you get to numbers that are at the different locations. And that's the number you'll flip to in the book. So then you can open up the map and see, okay, this is where I'm at. This is what's happening at this particular location on the map. Each mission was made up of several pages that will go, once you finish a page, they'll tell you where to go on the next page. Um, and then you wrap that one and you go up to the next page. And then you play through until either you fail the mission or you succeed it, which again, the conditions are on the mission card itself. In addition to these mission cards, which you'll need uh, to begin every mission, um, you've got some other things that you're going to use. First of all, we've got all of these miniatures that are very well sculpted. This, is, this one's my favorite. This is Smokey, the adversary, the big bad of the game. Um, and then you've got a bunch of different creatures. There are some scorpions. There's this big old Rust Lord guy. He's got a pocket knife as an arm. Um, <laughs> So some really cool, very well done uh, miniatures over there. Up here, you've got some various items you're gonna need in the game. Now, here's a bag of onion snoodles, uh, water bottle, mouse trap, and then this is an example of travel. This is a milk carton boat that you can hop in and, and then ride down a river in it. You got a campaign dashboard that keeps track of time. If you found any clues to what's going on in this world, what happened to this in this calamity, some gear, some scrap, uh, morale, the number of population in your colony, and then finally your food, the number of cheese that you have. Over here we have our enemy cards, and just depending on the scenario, various creatures will come out. Here's a scrapper leader, it's like a rat. Here's this mouse, it's a meekling. 
Um, ooh, this is a gecko hunter. He's got a sniper. That's pretty cool. Uh, roaches, those are my least favorite because I hate roaches. Um, scorpions, I'd rather have a scorpion than a roach, honestly. Um, so lots of different uh, adversaries you're gonna come across. This is a big old deck of item cards. An example is aluminum armor or a shoe leather vest. You've got a shampoo cap that's a helmet that you can wear. Um, fashion doll helm, wars fork. Let's see what else, what are some of my other favorites? You've got a glass launcher, that one's pretty awesome. So some cool, there are defensive items, there are offensive items, uh, things that are like once per use, uh, once, once per mission use, one use per mission card, let me get that right, uh, laser pointer, so lots of variety with the items there. This is the action card deck, and you'll see that there are mostly what looks like, look like cool versions of playing cards, actually. You've got uh, what looks like a king there, a queen here. Um, this is how you're going to resolve checks, action checks, like moving, um, attacking, that sort of thing. There's some other cards, like these environment cards, depending on where you are, you might have some added rules, like traversing or forced movement, such as whenever you're going down a river. Uh, down here are some conditions, like uh, trapped, rattled, badly hurt. These are going to restrict you um, in, at various points in the game whenever you get those conditions. Over here are encounter cards. They'll set up these encounters. Um, it'll tell you how many enemies to put out and uh, what the loot is whenever you complete the encounter. Um, or they may say, say something like, this says go to E3, um, which tells you to go to a particular entry. So um, there's a lot of variety there in far, as far as what they do. Finally, we've got these attribute cards that uh, whenever the characters gain experience, they're going to be able to get these attributes that add special abilities. Now, they start with a basic one, but then throughout the game, throughout the, com throughout the campaign, you're going to add more that are going to carry over from mission to mission. In fact, many things carry over from mission to mission. Of course, your population does because um, that's, that is what it is. Your population, your food, a lot of what's on the campaign dashboard carries over. Any items that you gain gets to go into a shared reservoir, for lack of a better word, for other, for other players to access on future rounds. Um, ally, allies that you make along the way will be available. You're actually actively building on to your, to your compound there, wherever you're staying, your colony. Um, so everything that you do from mission to mission is going to affect your future. Well, that's all you need to know. If you want to learn more about how the game works, do your own research. I'm done with this part. I want to start my analysis where I normally do, and that's with the production of the game. This is overall top-notch, as with what you've come to expect with Plaid Hat. Uh, the miniatures are well done, so detailed. The artwork is, is amazing. It's so evocative of what's going on. It brings you in, draws you into the story. Um, just the components themselves, the, the book with the spiral, bounding, uh, spiral binding, um, it's all very well done. And with that art, you've got the attention to detail, like just the little things that you may not initially think about, but they're crafting this world from this perspective of a mouse or from a guinea pig. And so just things you wouldn't see on a normal day-to-day -day basis that are things that are in the grass or the way that certain structures may look from a different angle. Um, they're all designed from the perspective. It's almost like they got down on the ground and started to look around and then uh, make the artwork from there. It's very well done and definitely brings you into the ambiance of the story. Now I want to move on to the story and the writing. Um, the, the team, the writing team did a fantastic job. Um, there are so, there's so much writing in this story. There's so much text um, that almost feels at times like you're reading a book. If you ever wanted to play through a book, well, this is a game that does that. Um, it goes beyond what you've seen in something like Stuff Fables. Um, there's just so much more text because they are telling a, an in-depth, detailed story. Um, this character that we met, are they going to be okay? Are we going to be able to save them, help them? You end up having feelings. You feel, feel the feels in this game beyond just what you feel about like the mechanisms and whatnot. This is a story that you're playing through. Now I want to touch on exploration. There's this giant world to explore. Um, with 20 plus missions, there are so many, uh, so many different places you can go, and each of those places have, have so much to explore. I mean, with 105 pages in the storybook, most of them, each one having a different location, um, it's, it's a vast, vast place that you can explore. Now, it's still pretty linear. Like if you go to do a mission, you're gonna follow a certain path along the way. 
um, in most of them. Um, so it's not like you can just go open up a book and, and see what happens. But as you play through each of those missions, um, different places get revealed, different items, different characters. It's all unraveling as you play through the game. And again, it makes you just think, oh my goodness, what are we going to come across next? One thing I appreciated about this game with the missions is that you don't have to start at the beginning and then continue. Um, you, you are given a certain amount of starting missions from those cards that you can choose to start with, but you don't have to start with the first one. You can choose uh, mission 8, 8A, or 8B, or whatever, however many that they gave you to start with. And then as you go, more missions become unlocked. Um, I like that you can choose, mm, I don't think I'm ready to go here yet. I'm going to go over here and do this mission instead. And that choice is something I really appreciate. And speaking of choices, there are so many choices to make in the game. One of them is, you know, there are certain characters you come across and you can either try to attack them or communicate to befriend them. Um, that's one. There are certain situations. How do we handle this? How are we going to go about uh, solving this problem? And when it comes to enemies, if you're in an encounter and you're doing well, then maybe you can finish them off. But if you're doing poorly, maybe you decide, let's just cut our losses and leave. If you do that, though, the enemies can follow you. They may show up later on in the mission, which I love. I love that aspect of the game. Another thing I love is the test system in this game. You know, Stuff Fables had this dice, uh, dice test system, which is great, but the way that this one does, it ups the notch with the cards. Um, the way that you, you draw those cards, and you can use them, They're, you can plan better. You can hold on to the cards. Um, the cards that you choose to put together to be able to succeed, you may hold on to one or play it now just depending on what you think. And then just the addition of that, that uncertainty with that die that you're going to roll uh, makes things a little tense, um, but a lot less random than just rolling a whole bunch of dice. So I, I really appreciate the test system. As far as ages go, now the box says 14 and up, which um, I understand there's some reasons why they had to do that, but you don't have to be 14 to play this game. We started playing this, this game with my daughter when she was six. And of course, there were moments where we were like, okay, Emma, what do you want to do? And then we ha had to explain how she could do that but she eventually got the hang of the system and was able to do everything on her own. So definitely don't think um, you have to wait till someone's 14. Um, just use your best judgment though. Um, mechanically, it's not too complex. Maybe a little bit scary with some of the, with the monsters or the cats or whatever. Um, but as far as understanding the game and getting it, everyone's working together. I think you'll have no problems with younger kids. I think the game is just the right difficulty. Um, it's not too hard. Um, it feels challenging. There are moments where you feel like, how are we going to get out of this? And sometimes you may fail, but I feel like, you know, 80% of the time you can do it. You can get through it. It's not going to feel easy all the time, but um, there's enough of a challenge there for it to be interesting. I do have a few negatives about the game. They're just, just a little bit. Um, first of all, this isn't necessarily a negative, more of a note to myself and to you if you decide to play the game, is that the points of er various points of interest on the map, you have to go check out every one. Um, if you don't, you might miss something that you have to have later on in the game um, to be able to advance forward in the campaign. Certain cards will become unlocked based on some of these points of interest. So if you skip over those, you're like, oh, we're being chased. I'm just going to go on to the next page. You're going to miss something, and um, it's going to mess up your campaign experience. So don't do that. Um, everything kind of relies on unlocking things and exploring, as I mentioned before. And so you can't go on certain missions if you haven't explored that, if you haven't seen something that leads into that. So make sure you check out everything that's on the page. There's a driving system in the game that you can get into vehicles and drive them and you get out these cards and you move your little vehicle along the road and then there are enemies that come, they're also driving in cards. And while I think it's a great idea, I just think it's a little clunky. I think that it just takes up too much time to go away from the main mission and do this little encounter in cars with a separate area of the board and then the rules, you kind of have to look up some new stuff whenever you're playing those. Um, so I wasn't really a fan of that. And speaking of looking up rules, I have to say there are some issues with the rule book. I feel like there were some instances where things were very vague, and then sometimes where I felt like rules were left out altogether. Um, you can play the game with the rule book, um, but you might have to look up some questions on Board Game Geek. So just be aware of that. Let's talk about the time to play. You can play this. Each mission lasts about an hour to two hours. Now, technically, because you're going from page to page, you could like play one page, go to the next page, and then take a break and go do something else. I don't recommend playing one page and then putting it back in the box and coming back and playing another page. It's just too much of a, a distance there between your play sessions that you'll forget stuff. It's, um, 
it's cumbersome to get all that stuff out and put it back in and put it all back out, I recommend just trying to play through an entire mission without stopping. Stuff Fables is a loved game in this household, and one thing I really appreciated is that there are little homages to Stuff Fables in this game, and I'll leave those for you to discover, but it's fun to see um, little pieces of Stuff Fables in this game. And when comparing the two, um, definitely this is a, an improvement over Stuff Fables, for sure. Um, I didn't play Comanauts, but I definitely prefer this to Stuff Fables. It's just a theme that I enjoy better, and the system, especially the test system, is much better. Um, it doesn't take anything away from Stuff Fables. It's still a fun game, but this is definitely an improvement. There's some uh, familiar things, like the enemies and the track. This track thingy is familiar. Um, but overall, I think it's a better game, and I think people will really enjoy it. Now, I will say, when we were done, we explored pretty much all the missions. Um, we were sad when it was over because we went through so much, and it's just like, oh wait, there's nothing else left for us to do. However, you can play it again. Um, you can reset, it's fully resettable, and um, you can play again. Now, I don't know if there are going to be too many differences between the times you play. Um, the order you take the missions in, sure. Um, there are some choices, but overall, you're going to play through the same thing, and the outcome might might be different. But you know, if you put enough distance between one play and another, you're going to enjoy it that much more. In all seriousness, is a phrase I rarely say, but it applies to the following sentences. Playing through Aftermath with my family was a very special experience that I'll not soon forget. I won't say that this is a family game. I think a group of friends will enjoy playing through it just as much. I think Aftermath isn't a typical campaign game. The details, the numerous choices, the mechanisms, the engaging and adventurous story, the lovable and loathable characters, the challenge, the excitement, and the memorable moments have all been developed beyond what I've seen. With other campaign games, some missions or chapters have just felt obligatory, like I'll play this begrudgingly just so I can move on. But that didn't happen with us. In the 20 plus missions we played, we always looked forward to the next one. I tallied the points, did some addition, and now, after math, I come up with a score of 9.5. It gets a seal of excellence, no question. I want to thank you so much for watching this video. Do you like math? Arnold Schwarzenegger? Pennywise? Let me know. Tweet to me at hey underscore lighten up. And check out and subscribe to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash the lighten up initiative, where you'll find comedy sketches, reviews, playthroughs, and more. Until next time, don't take the board game hobby too seriously. Have fun, enjoy your experiences, and don't let your score or other players bring you down. Just lighten up.